Coffee with H Times 2. Today on our show, we will be talking about environmental issues, sustainability, and advocacy. What's happening with our planet today in a Trump era? So we have a new president, a new climate, a new set of agendas and issues that are on the table. And we're going to talk with activists from New York who are working on a variety of environmental issues with Mothers Out Front, which is Shumika Hansen is representing them and she works for them. Uh, they work on climate and mothers issues and mothers as grassroots activists. Obviously, it's for parents too. It's not just mothers, but the focus, as we can see from the title on her t-shirt, is Mothers Out Front. And we have Kim Fratchik and Patrick Robbins from Sane Energy. They're the founders of the, a group that works on energy, renewable energy, and other issues. So we're going to get right to it. Welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Great to have you here. So why don't we start with Shamika. Tell us about Mothers Out Front, what it is, and what you all do. So we're a 501c3. Uh, we work with mothers, grandmothers, caregivers, allies to uh, empower mothers and grandmothers to become climate change leaders in their communities and they do this by getting their local elected officials as well as decision makers to act on their behalf uh, for a swift and just transition from fossil fuels to renewables. Okay and what does Sane Energy do? What is your, what's on your, in your game plan? Um, we're, uh, we're also focused on climate. Uh, our work entails stopping uh, fracking infrastructure and also bringing a swift uh, transition, just transition, to renewable uh, and sustainable energy systems. And we focus mainly on the state of New York, um, but we work with allies regionally through the Northeast. So what are some of your big hot, hot issues that you're, you're working on right now? Right now we have two offshore wind farms that were approved and we have our governor who's given the go-ahead that we will purchase power from these offshore wind farms. One is on eastern Long Island and one is off the coast of the Rockaways in Long Beach. So we want to make sure that these offshore wind farms get developed uh, in accord with uh, community justice, community benefits, making sure that we use local union labor, making sure that our uh, low income rate payers aren't footing the bill for a transition to a different type of generation. Uh, we also work on um, energy democracy. So this is actually working on the policy level to make sure that residents uh, have uh, more of a choice in how their energy system is run where the utility giants aren't directing our lives. We do uh, direct action campaigns and uh, uh, educational work on fracking infrastructure that is coming from the shale fields of Pennsylvania and Ohio. We're getting massive transmission systems moving through New York State where people's land uh, is being stolen by you know giant fossil fuel corporations in order to build these transmission systems to export the gas. So uh, it, that comes with a whole slew of issues. Uh, our health, safety, and democracy are at stake here. Oh, okay. And so, Shamika, could you give us an example of a project that some of your grassroots mothers are doing? Sure. Um, so particularly in New York, uh, in the upstate region, southern tier Rochester area, uh, mothers are working on some of the pipeline and energy issues, such as AIM Spectra. They're also working on Bakken oil shale um, and another campaign to what they're calling seal the cracks um, to kind of look into methane leaks. Uh, there are mothers in Long Island who are extremely, extremely uh, concerned about our water issues here and how mm -hmm. climate change uh, is really a threat multiplier to that. So as climate change issues um, become more, you know, the storms become more frequent, um, the, the different things that we're seeing with our climate, uh, global warming starting to wreak havoc on the local area, that is going to take a big toll on our, um, our water since we on Long Island get it all from an aquifer, which is sitting right underneath us. And there's already a lot of stresses to that as it is. Um, so there are mothers working in uh, at least four or five states officially, uh, including New York, Massachusetts, Virginia, and California, and then another 14 to 19 states kind of on hold, just waiting to start their community campaigns and getting local wins. So I have a couple of questions for you about a term called ecofeminism. So in our audience today is my, my class, which is an ecofeminism class. And they'll be asking you questions in a little while. But we were, we were at a meeting last night, an organizing meeting on Long Island. And predominantly in the room was mostly women, right? Um, and obviously mothers out front, I would imagine. I haven't been to your meetings yet, but I know some of your members. And they're all women. And I know some of the leaders in the group, they're all, they're all women. So 
Could you talk a little bit about, any of you, why you see so many women um, doing environmental work, doing climate change work, working on fracking issues? Why, why are so many women involved? Well, I mean, I, I think I, I, I see intuitively the, 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 the women that I uh, work with and, and, and the men that I work with are, are in, you know, I think there's some sort of like physiological connection to, to responding to the planet's emergency. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot, the, the planet is, is in, a, in a death cycle right now and I think people are responding to that and I, I the planet is a, is a female entity and it's a, it's a mother and I think that is something that we, we may be responding to. Also, you know, just along the lines of our of our culture, you know, women are typically the caregivers, right? Mm -hmm. So we're responding in, in, in that way. I mean, you, you both probably have different, you know, ideas of this or... I, I love to hear what Patrick has to say because obviously you're male, so... <laughs> yes, and I'm, I'm aware of myself as, you know, as the, you know, a male voice here, but I do think that I disagree somewhat. I don't believe that there is an inherent physiological connection. However, I do believe that there are ways in which men are socialized and women are socialized very differently in this culture. And I think that part of why I am more inclined to take a uh, culturally constructed view of this issue is because it doesn't let men off the hook as mm -hmm. easily, right? Because if there's something inherent to maleness that prevents the qualities of empathy and everything else that you know have to be brought to the fore for this movement, mm -hmm. then there's nothing you can do. However, I think that there is work that men can do, important work in undoing the culture of toxic masculinity mm. and you know channeling that into the work as well. That's my take on it. And do you think that toxic masculinity is, is in part responsible for the way things are going with our planet, for the destruction that we, we see in, in our environment? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's all of a piece, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you have a capitalist mentality that puts profit first, um, and that mentality has been a huge factor in the ways in which, uh, in the ways in which women's bodies are viewed. Mm -hmm. So um, Caliban and the Witch by Sylvia Federici was really helpful for me in thinking through these mm -hmm. issues, where mm -hmm. it talks about how women's bodies were the subject of the original enclosure movement in Europe in the Middle Ages, and that would be the witch trials, and everything proceeded from there. Oh, Much longer topic. Yeah, um, I know. But, yeah. I used to teach the 18th century, so the whole enclosure oh, cool. thing is, makes sense. The, that was basically closing off land. That was public land available for towns, and then became private property. Violent enforced <laughs> privatization, right. yes. So people could grow their own food, and they could hunt, and they shared the space, and they no longer had that. So if you weren't wealthy, you had no access to food, Precisely. essentially, and which was really, right. And then there were people who were then forced to move to cities and work, for, work in factories, and sort of the whole Marxist trajectory of what happened with the Industrial Revolution. So just mm -hmm. a little background there. Um, and so, Shamika, why do you think um, it's that women play such a vital role in the climate movement? Um, I think it's because they are also, um, or we are also affected differently. Um, so caregiving becomes harder if that's the role that you're considering. Um, you know, thinking about the house and home, if it is from a cultural and societal kind of standpoint, a lot of women are the ones who are at home doing the uh, caregiving that are taking care of a lot of these energy bills that when you see these bills skyrocketing and you're not understanding why, part of it is because you may be footing the cost for some new compressor station or some coal-fired factory or something of the sort. Um, and a lot of people don't make these connections. Uh, the, the water that you're using, you know, you're, you're making your baby's bottle kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I think it's the idea that um, a lot of women are being displaced and are being um, discomforted by these issues more so maybe than the men in this in this uh, society. I'm not saying that's something worldwide, but as you look to other countries, we do see that uh, climate change and global warming are having uh, different effects on the women of the world than they are uh, of the men for various reasons. Great, those are really, really good explanations. Um, so I wanna just ask you how you came to, to be activists. So if you would call yourself that. Um, so just, you know, what brought you here and what <coughs> your past were? So Kim, would you, would you, I know you were an artist, you're still doing art, so could you mm -hmm. just tell us about your, your story? 
Sure. Um, well, I, I spent a lot of time uh, in uh, hanging out on the streets of West Philly when I was a teenager. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I met a bunch of squatters and I, we were, I was into punk music. And, uh, you know, we had an anarchist collective space there called the A-Space. And I met the MOVE family, the Africa family, who had a bomb dropped on their house in 1985 by the mayor of Philadelphia. They were naturalists. I don't, I don't necessarily want to define them into, into one category, but um, they were living an alternative lifestyle to the lifestyle of you know, a confined city. Um, and uh, they were primarily black, and the city is very racist. And you know, when I was a kid, I, I moved to Philadelphia in 1985, and I was 10. And I remember seeing the bomb being dropped on the house on television. I didn't really understand what was going on. And then when I was older and I met them, I was in my later teenage years, I listened to their story and I heard them and, and it was just like, my mind was blown. And all of a sudden, the, the power structure and, the, and what you normally think of as, as, as normal or what you, what you think of as like being truth was completely upended. And, and that led me to, to work with Mumia Abu-Jamal's campaign and then I got involved in you know, other things of oppression like animal rights and um, environmental you know, uh, work and things like that. And uh, in Pennsylvania, there's massive uh, you know, fracking going on. People can't drink their water. They can't bathe their children. And where I live in New York City now, and there is a giant pipeline coming into uh, New York City from the shale fields of Pennsylvania. Knowing what's happening on the other side of that pipeline uh, and seeing how all the politics were working with Mayor Bloomberg convincing the city to convert their boilers to natural gas, it just like opens up that whole pocket again mm -hmm. of injustice, you know, the, the patriarchal decisions for the culture um, on, on how our city is going to be run. Um, I have a very different view on how a city can be run. And uh, that's what got me involved in the fracking fight. So, okay. you know, I worked hard to fight fracking and, and, the, and the ancillary infrastructure. Okay. And I know you bring a lot of art to your work. So yeah, the protests, you the have cultural big work. puppets. And sure. Yeah, the cultural work of activism is really important. We need to be able to tell our story to the world. We want uh, people to understand, uh, you know, if I talk about fracking and pipelines, mm -hmm. and that might be boring for people, but if I am able to capture it where it's an interesting and fun story to hear or it's it's a beautiful image or something that draws people in. We will go out into the public square and do giant storybooks called contastorias where they rhyme like a Dr. Seuss story and people usually gather around and listen to the story mm -hmm. and then they applaud at the end typically or laugh and we, we have a good time. and. It brings people to commune with each other in the public square, mm -hmm. and that is a, another thing. Public space is a really big part of the environment, and mm -hmm. and sharing that together and sharing art and joy, I think, is is a really important way to start a conversation mm -hmm. with people, which which is really what this is all about. I love that. I love that the bringing the, the art and the joy to it because yeah. it can seem it can it's a it's a heavy topic. It's overbearing, yeah. Yeah, it can be very 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 difficult. I know for my class right now, we're only in the second week, and they're reading Sandra Steingraber's Living downstream mm -hmm. which is such a difficult book to read it's so important but yeah. it's very very painful read so sure. I'm sure they're relating to that and that idea that we can we can bring joy to it and some kind of creativity whatever our creative form is is, yeah. is so important to sustain ourselves exactly. right? it's about sustainability yeah. so having that balance so fight. Patrick what brought you to this work well you know it's funny I was all set to go into publishing right when I was an undergrad mm. and your it dad's was, a writer and editor? Uh, yes, that's true. At Audubon? Uh, yes, he was, was the editor of Audubon for some time. Um, and I took a course on the history of American environmentalism, and that's mm -hmm. where we read uh, Elizabeth Colbert's incredible collection of essays, Field Notes from a Catastrophe, mm -hmm. which I would recommend to anyone. And grasping the enormity of the climate crisis and what it actually means and will mean for this planet and for the people who live here, um, it was pretty much an overnight conversion. Mm -hmm. uh, I Everything else that I had been planning on doing with my life and doing with my work seemed suddenly beside the point, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, this is a fight for survival and this is, you know, in my opinion, the most important thing that one could be doing right now. And so I sort of shifted course. I um, 
got a graduate degree in climate science and policy and was thinking I could still do communicative work, but in that sphere mm -hmm. and with an eye toward climate issues. Mm -hmm. I came to the anti-fossil fuel infrastructure fight when Kim and I were part of a group called Occupy the Pipeline, um, which was fighting the construction of a high pressure gas pipeline into the West Village. Mm -hmm. And learning about how, this was sort of, I guess, the second awakening where you first learn about, or at least I first learned about the climate crisis and the gravity of the crisis. Mm -hmm. And then having a firsthand experience with how utterly broken and corrupt um, our political edifice really is and the way in which it is designed to prioritize the interests of the rich. And learning more about that and having that firsthand experience um, became something that further activated me and further made me think this is something that I wanted to be able to give my full attention and my full time. Excellent, and you all have done such amazing things. Thank we, you. we don't have time to go into all of them, but I encourage our listeners to, to, to look into SANE Energy and what you're doing, and we'll have more. We're gonna have a talk back with students, which will be a separate episode, Great. but I recommend people watch that as well. So, so Shamika, what brought you to, <laughs> to this work? Oh, Heidi, <laughs> <laughs> don't you know? Um, so obviously, as you know, I am a Stony Brook alum. Um, and I'm coming in from Nassau Community College. So I initially started off not knowing exactly what I wanted to do, kind of just wanting to help people in that general sphere um, and really thinking I was going to go and be a pediatrician. And then I was like, hmm, it's a lot of math and science and residency requirements and school and one failed class away from starting all over again. And I figured I may want to do something that I think I should can bite off easily and that will really speak to the degrees that I got um, in Nassau. So I left with a um, associates in communications focusing on public speaking and interpersonal relationship mm. building and um, I came to Stony Brook. Uh, I started off with the sustainability program and it was a lot more science and math and not enough of um, kind of the cultural aspects, the societal aspects, the communicating with people, um, building people power kind of thing. And I wanted to focus on that. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Environmental Humanities Program did. And um, in the year that I spent uh, really focusing on environmental humanities, read a lot of great books um, through the program, met some amazing activists uh, going up to Omega, going to the Clearwater Festival, and really just meeting people and hearing their stories kind of shifted the way I was thinking about things right. and the kind of work that I was doing and how I went about doing it. And um, I went from kind of coordinating volunteers at this larger music festival um, to now instead really building um, people's agency and their ability to be leaders in their community and educating them about what that means. As Patrick said, you know, our political system's kind of broken, but one thing it does do well is if enough people get up and enough people complain, something will happen. So we all have our kind of uh, individual uh, actions that we can take and voices that we can use to really bring together to a larger piece of the pie and, and, and really make effective change. And it looks different from right. everyone else. So I'm kind of just really doing this work because where I'm strongest and my um, strongest abilities, I think, l lie with communicating with people, um, bringing together politics and science and different environmental issues and bringing it down to kind of a layman's terms to get the community understanding what that looks like. And you're interested in policy. I, I understand you're applying to law schools. So mm. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure you'll be bringing this in more into the legal realm and policy realm, which is very, very exciting. Hopefully soon, yes. I don't so, think I knew that. That's very cool. Is, I've yeah. been keeping that under wraps. It's, Sorry, quite, it's that, quite the it's stressor, out, yeah. It's out. So I heard it is on TV. The news, it's, the, yes, it's a dual, dual degree right now. The it's news kind of out. So, okay. Well, so we have to end. Uh, there is just so much I could be asking you, and we'll have you back. I would love to have you back on the show, all, of, all three of you. And this is an exciting time because activism is now cool. And so just want to say thanks. And if you want to see more of our shows, they're at HeidiHutner.com. This is Heidi Hutner and Coffee with H Times 2.